Let me make sure we're, yes, we're recording and we can see our voice. All righty, folks, this is the last of the modules where before we get into our final. So let me do a little setup here. Excuse me for all the scrolling. So last week, we kind of went through understanding by design for the last time. And we talked about how to use the template. Remember, you may use the template for that assignment as one of the five for your final. When we talk about things like TPAC and technology integration matrix, and we talk about understanding by design, if you'll remember, um, Grant talked about understanding by design as a framework, not a curriculum. And the other two are theoretical frameworks. Well, universal design for learning is called a framework, but I think it's more of a heart work. Uh, I think that universal design for learning just speaks very, very eloquently to something that we have kind of forgotten about. Um, and I also think it speaks more eloquently to differentiation than does Tomlinson. And I also think it speaks very eloquently to its cousin framework, understanding by design. Um, it is a framework that was developed. And let me go ahead and dive in here. It was developed by the good folks at uh, CAST. Uh, if you want to see it, it's right here. Sit and watch this video. Uh, it will explain everything for you. The person at uh, CAST was Dr. David Rose. Um, and here's the difference. Dr. Rose is a neurologist. He's not an educator. And what he was doing was he was looking at how the brain fires up when different stimuli are given to it. And in that research, he found that there were three significant areas of the brain that are involved when you're trying to learn something. They have as their mantra, motto, if you will, that there are multiple pathways in to the benefit of all, that one size does not fit all. But I think where he differs from uh, Tomlinson's differentiation is I think that they see technology being a way to help with implementing universal design for learning. So in that uh, idea, we're gonna take a look at uh, Edpuzzle. I'm gonna show you how Edpuzzle works and here's the tutorial down here. Uh, as you can see, I have lots and lots of universal design for learning stuff in here for you. And the reason why I do is I'm going to ask you to please um, include something in your one of your lessons in your mini unit could be identified as a UDL example. Now, if you want to use Edpuzzle, that's fine. But Edpuzzle is just a example of UDL. It is not UDL. UDL is a lot more than that. But let me do this. Let me go ahead and run this PowerPoint by you. You know how I don't like PowerPoints, but I think this one uh, makes sense. So let me go ahead and pull it up because there's a lot here that I think will go a long way to helping you see what I'm talking about. And if you're okay with it, I'll go ahead and leave the PowerPoint up like this so that we can, um, so I can see it and move through it and be okay. So what I wanna do with this, and I'll jump through it, don't worry, I'm not gonna make you sit through all, I forget how many slides it is. But so the idea of universal design for learning, what is it, where did it come from? 
Well, there's where it came from. So the idea was ex access, participation, progress, and general education curriculum for all learners from the IDA Act, 1970, 1997, excuse me, is also based upon the ADA Act, which was primarily designed as a way for people to have access. Now, what I find interesting, two things. Go in any grocery store, go to any big box store, Lowe's, Home Depot, etc. And you probably won't notice this. You have to be somebody who doesn't see very well like me. And one of the things that you'll notice is suddenly things are bigger. The text, the size of text in stores now is bigger for things like uh, aisle labels. If you look on the back of the food that you buy, in great big, nice, big letters, it's telling you now what the calorie count is. I was in my local Kroger's one, and I asked a gentleman who was from the Kroger home office, because they were remodeling my Kroger. Kroger. I asked him, I said, are you all changing the signs? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, they seem to be bigger, the text. And he said, absolutely. We realize that as America grays, that we need to change uh, our signs so they're easier to read. That, to you, that's, that is exactly what we're talking about. We're making changes. We're applying different ideas to the benefit of everybody. So the fact that they make it bigger so people like me can see it, does it harm the person with 2020 vision? Not the least. Now, let me do a step aside here. Uh, those of you who are on campus, or those of you who have been on campus uh, lately, they've redone the Houchins building. That's where the registrar is, uh, the bursar. And that's where I think the Cardinal is, the Louisville Cardinal newspaper. I think it's located over there. And that's where you have to go get IDs made. So at one time, it had this ramp that looked like this. Now, when they redid it, it has a ramp that goes straight up. So in that retrofit, I would really like to find a wheelchair. And this would be a great uh, example of um, force and work taking that equation and actually testing it out to see how much work, how much force it would take to push an adult in a wheelchair up that ramp. I don't think a person on their own could get a wheelchair up that ramp. And maybe a scooter, maybe a scooter. So as you can see, this isn't just for special ed or for education. It has real consequences. Uh, I also notice, and you notice, if you've ever been around on UofL's campus, the talking street crossings, you know. That's all UDL. Or UD, actually. You need to consider the needs of the broadest possible range of users from the very beginning. Not one size fits all, but alternatives designed from the beginning, not added on later, increases access opportunities for everyone. How do we do that? Well, in the world around us, we do it with ramps, curb cuts, electric doors, captions on TV, easy grip tools. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. That's when I saw, that's when I saw the ramp at U of L. I was so shocked. I was like, what in the world are you people thinking by putting this thing in here? They went so far and take pictures of it. Now, let's jump over to Universal Design for Learning. So this is David Rose. Barriers to learning are not, in fact, inherent in the capacity of learners. Let's do that one again. Barriers to learning are not, in fact, inherent in the capacities of learner, but instead arise in learners' interactions with inflexible educational goals, materials, methods, and assessments. 
one of David's mantras that he throws out whenever he gives um, speeches is the student is not broken. It's the curriculum that's broken. The student isn't the problem. It's the curriculum that's the problem. Fix the curriculum, you fix the student. Um, and I tell you, I come from a background of being a special educator. And I come from a background of working with people that most people have walked away from. And I found that if I spent the time trying to get into that kid's head, trying to figure out the way they learned, learning occurred. And when I say I, were, I worked with people who were um, identified autistic um, on the moderate to severe end of that scale, and I worked with children with Down syndrome, and I worked with people, again, who were also identified as moderately to severely uh, learning disabled. So when I hear this kind of stuff, it just resonates within me. It just makes sense. But this does not have to be just for those kinds of students. You know, one of the most difficult things that we run into is we have a kid in the class who just can't get it, but yet doesn't have an IEP, doesn't have anything that indicates he has an issue. Oh, maybe he's, you know, identified as ADHD, whatever that means. You know, you, you realize that this is the thing that drives teachers crazy now is that we have so many different kinds of kids in classrooms. How do we reach them all? Well, let's take a look at Rose's research. So he basically came up with three different parts of the brain. We have the rec recognition network, strategic network, and affective network. When we have discrepancies, when we have um, not a complete network in place, in other words, if you're missing understandings in your recognition network, if your strategic network doesn't have strategies, you have a really difficult time learning. Let's go through. I won't do the, the quiz. We did the quiz last night in class. Um, I'm just going to run this by you. So if you look at the learning brain, the recognition network, that's the what of your learning. So this is where we identify and interpret pattern, patterns of sound, light, taste, smell, touch. And when you look at this, this is the part of your brain where everything that you have picked up, all of the connections you make, all those neurons that get linked together to form understandings, that's where they live. And you'll notice how large a part of the brain that is. The second part, this is the strategic part of your brain. So this is how you figure out how to plan and execute and monitor actions and skills. This is the how. This is where, when we have kids that struggle in class and we'll say, well, they just, they can't get themselves organized. Yep, because they don't have the strategies to be organized. So we have to help them get into their heads strategies for learning, not just the what's of learning. And then finally, we have the affective part of your brain. Now, the affected network is the why. It's the part of your brain that basically says, what, what am I trying to do here? And do what I need to do first? Kind of organization, but also if you think about us, it, it's how we engage with tasks and how we are motivated to do things. If you're just not motivated because you think you're stupid, or you're just not motivated because you're afraid of your, that shuts you down right there. And you see this all the time with kids, all the time. And the amazing thing about it is they're so clear in their signals they send to you. 
you know, the golden rule of high school is if I come into your class and put my head down, you don't bother me. I don't bother you because I, I, I'm, I've given up. I can't, I can't do this. So I've given up. It's one of the saddest things to see. So here's our old friend Vygotsky. Yay for Vygotsky. So in his philosophy of learning, or his theory, excuse me, not philosophy, his theory, he says we must recognize information, ideas, and concepts. One must be able to apply strategies to process the information. One must be engaged. So as you can see, what David was trying to do here, what Dr. Rose was trying to do here, he's basically saying, look, I'm a neurologist. This is what I see when I look at MRIs or the brain activity. Now, here's an educational theorist, and we're saying the exact same things. What I'm saying is, whereas Vygotsky was basically theorizing, I'm telling you, this is reality. It's real. Um, and I'll tell you, it's, uh, I'm not going to do the video because it's kind of long. But I would really urge you to watch uh, Dr. Rose's video. I'll show you which one when we get done with this. It's really uh, an eye-opener because he walks you through um, the, the research part where he got his ideas from. It's good stuff. And you know, the ozone of proximal development. This is the one that, of course, Vygotsky came up with. So again, we know these things. Hello, we know these things. We know just by almost common sense or experience as educators, that if we can help kids by breaking things down so they can understand them in little bits, if we can give support to their understanding, scaffolding it for them, all UDL is saying is that all learners are unique and universal does not mean one size fits all. What universal means is the simple idea that there are multiple pathways in to understanding, to learning, that are a benefit to all. Uh, this is where I launch into my story uh, that I tell every time I talk about UDL, and I'm going to tell it to you right now. So I have a dear friend whose name is Bill, and Bill is uh, a brother from another mother, and Bill is blessed with four amazing children. He has three daughters and one son. One daughter is a National Merit finalist. She had a full ride to Center College, got a job working at Goldman Sachs right out of college, was able to retire at the ripe old age of 26. One daughter is an artist. Uh, she is slowly but surely gaining recognition as an artist. And the third daughter is a is an athlete and she got a full ride to Virginia Tech as a um, could remember now if it was so field hockey it was field hockey she got a full ride to field as field hockey now she works out of Washington DC for the National Geographic uh, Society there as an environmentalist and then there's David David is his son. David was born with Down syndrome. I never got to work with David uh, as his teacher. By the time David came along and was ready for school, uh, I had already left the classroom and was working out at um, computer education in Jefferson County. But, of course, I had had many, many years, 15, uh, working with my kids, as I still call them today. And the thing I kept saying to my dear friend Bill was, you set the bar. David will rise to wherever you allow David to rise to. If you set the bar low because you feel sorry for him, then that's what you'll get. If you set the bar high, which obviously you did for your three daughters, David will rise to that. David, when he was in school, was the classic example of universal design for learning. If the teacher would listen, David, David always had a way to do the work. 
that may may or may not have been the way that everybody else in the room did it. But the final product was the same, his demonstration of understanding. David was in an AP American history class in high school. The teacher was very reluctant to take him until he met David and sat down and talked to him. And he talked about the final project that they did in this class before they took the AP history test. David asked if he would allow him to make his own project that was not necessarily a term paper, research paper. And the teacher wisely said, as long as you follow the guidelines. That's all David wanted. So for his research paper, he made an iMovie of the development and the growth of jazz music. David's a big music guy. And in it, he quoted his sources at the end. He ran that classic screen at the end. You know, he put all his, now I got this from here, this from here, and this from here. Did he meet the outline of the final project? It wasn't 50 pages long, but it certainly met every other criteria. So yeah, he did. And I can remember sitting with David and his dad at his house when he announced to everybody that what he really wanted to do in life was to be a movie star. And we all kind of smiled and did that knowing kind of nod of, sure, yeah, good for you. And then one day, Bill, well, Bill and I worked in the same office. He came to me and he said, okay, you know how to do all this. Will you please help David create a YouTube channel? And I looked at him and I said, what are we going to do it for? He said, well, David's still stuck on this idea about being a movie star. And so I thought if I give him a chance to have his own YouTube channel, it, he'll, it'll get out of his system. Okay. So Bill pulls up a chair and sits down with me and he says, okay. And I said, no. <laughs> Uh, David needs to be sitting here. I'm going to teach David how to do this. You're just David's um, advisor. You're, you're David's producer. You're not David. So David came in to see me later, and we sat and talked, and what he wanted to do is he wanted to create a cooking show. He was enthralled with Alton Brown. I don't know if you know who Alton Brown is on the cooking um, channel. Um, I think we're all enthralled with Alton Brown. And he said he wanted to be like Alton Brown. I said, great. So we talked about uh, camera setups. We talked about how he had to slow down his speech, uh, how he had to enunciate a little bit more clearly. I could understand David perfectly. But I don't know if you've ever noticed that when you actually record yourself talking like I am now, one of the things that you have to be aware of is you over enunciate and you kind of slowly talk. You use the speed of your voice to be the emphasis of what you're trying to say. He was a sponge. He took everything in I said. So he created a YouTube channel called Cooking with David. Now, what happened was there was a script and a movie idea that was being financed through people here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, it was at a time when people were thinking about making Kentucky the next Georgia. I don't know if you know about this. The state of Georgia is where a lot of movies are shot because they have such lenient and tax incentives for movie companies. Um, I always find it interesting when people find out that a lot of the Marvel movies, a lot of those Marvel comic book movies are shot in Georgia. Isn't that interesting? The Walking Dead was all shot in Georgia, which they make no bones about in the storyline. They place it in Georgia. But I, I just find it interesting that um, a lot of the Marvel's uh, movies were shot in Georgia. So people were trying to get that kind of thing going in Kentucky. And so there was a movie called um, Where Hope Grows 
which was a story about a washed out uh, major league baseball player who becomes an alcoholic, loses his wife who dies. Uh, and then all he's left with is his daughter and his, and his booze, his drinking. Until he meets a young man who works in a grocery store. And the young man is, quote unquote, handicapped. And through their interactions, he learns a greater truth. Well, David was determined he was going to be that person. And so he and his family came to me again. They said, can you help us with this? Well, I happen to be friends with someone who is a bona fide director and movie star, not movie star, TV star. He was one of the characters, one of the actual, not a Muppet, but one, <laughs> one of the people that inhabited uh, Sesame Street. He was one of those uh, for many years. So I called him up and I said, can you give me a hand with this? And he said, sure. So he shows up one uh, Sunday. We went into the mail room in the College of Education, the University of Louisville, and we filmed David's audition tape. Now, what was so funny about it was the way my buddy set it up. I'm off camera. The camera is just on David. You don't see David and I in any frame. Uh, and David is basically delivering his lines. And I'm off camera, you know, giving him his lines. Very classic technique. And one of the things that was so funny about it was here is this kid who has been labeled all his life as uh, Down syndrome and moderately disabled and all this other which is carrying off a tour, tour de force with his doing the script, putting the emphasis on the right words, et cetera, et cetera. And the scene is he's in this grocery store. Of course, this is all fake. There's no grocery store. It's just the mail room. But there's fruit there. And so what David is doing is he's responding to the washed out baseball player, me, uh, who is um, very dubious about David's ability to help him in the grocery store because David comes up to him and says, can I help you? And so David picks up a piece of fruit and he tosses it to him. And he says, look on the bottom of the fruit. And then he reads off the code to him and, or David tells him the code, excuse me. And he says, this is what it means. Now, if any of you know me, you know that I'm legally blind. So I'm standing in this room with this kid who's throwing fruit at me from across the room. And probably out of the five pieces of fruit that are in this script that they do this, you know, give and take with, I caught one. And in the audition tape, you hear the other fruit hitting the wall. You hear it hitting a locker. You hear it. It's, it's hilarious. Never, never, David never went out of character. Never lost his focus. He got the part. He's a legitimate movie star. He has his SAG card. Right now, um, he has an agent. <laughs> this cracks me up every time I tell this story. He has an agent. Um, and they're looking for new properties for him to be in. Another young man, Andrew, severely autistic. When he first came to me, his mother was told to, to deliver him with a refrigerator box that he could sit in because he wouldn't be able to handle all of the distractions and noise that would be in my classroom. I told her to take the refrigerator box away. And we worked with Andrew, we worked with Andrew to desensitize him to uh, noise. And one of the things that I did, I did this with all of my kids, but especially my autistic kids, I take them swimming, I taught them how to swim. And if you think about what swimming is, one of the really cool things about swimming is it's a sensory deprivation. You're, you're underwater. And so what you're doing is, is you're able to focus on what you're supposed to be doing, your stroke. And I find, find that a lot of the folks that I worked with labeled autistic were really, really good swimmers. Uh, I remember the first time I put Andrew into the pool um, up at Crescent Hill. He went right under. Usually it takes you a while to get kids to, you know, put their face in the water. Nah, not Andrew. He went right under. And when I brought him up, he had this great big smile on his face because the water 
had blocked all that noise. We worked really hard to help him become desensitized to all of that. But I never was able to get a sense that he was learning anything. Oh, we were behavior modding him all over the place. I was being a very good Skinnerian. But one day I was sitting with him in my classroom, and it's been a while ago. So the only technology I had in my classroom was an Apple IIe. And we were sitting there, sitting next to each other, and I was showing him how to operate the keyboard. And every once in a while, I'd say, can you find the A for your name? And he would very quickly just poke at it real fast. And then I would be in the good behavior list that I am. I would then do that over and over again to see how many times they get it right. And he would get more and more upset. Now, I couldn't take David to the lunchroom uh, because of all the noise. <laughs> and you know this. Uh, lunch rooms are probably the most overload uh, auditory and visual thing you can put somebody into. So he would always eat lunch with me. So we're sitting there at the, at the computer. And he grabs my hand. Not in an aggressive way. Just reached over and took my hand. And I don't know why but I made a pointy finger out of my hand and he started using my hand to type out things on the computer keyboard. And he typed, I not a U T I T I C a I not stupid. I smart and I lost it. So what did we do? Well, we changed everything up. Now we realize we had a pathway in and we started teaching him how to seriously keyboard. He'd been learning all along in all the five years that he had been in different environments he had been learning his mother god love her would always read to him she did everything that you're supposed to do she would read to him she would point at the words they would spell the words out together david uh, Al, uh, andrew couldn't speak but he would nod along with her he was learning It, in a matter of two years, we went from this guy being identified as moderately intellectually disabled to when we did the IQ test for his exit from um, elementary school, fifth grade. By the way, he was fully integrated into fifth grade. How did you do that, Steve? Simple. We gave him a label maker. He would sit and literally type out his answers on the label maker, and then he would print it out, tear the backing off, and put it on the worksheets that they did. He would contribute to any pro group projects because he could make things. He'd get excited, <laughs> and he'd get frustrated because he couldn't talk. The last IQ test uh, that he was given, he was 110. Multiple pathways in to the benefit of all. Simple. All righty. Uh, watch this. Okay. This is a good one. Um, and let me see. Let's see, this is, let me see if this is the original David Rose one. It is. This is the original David Rose presentation. Notice the signer over here on the left. Uh, so you, if you really want to get the full flavor of everything that I've just kind of stumbled through here, uh, it's 46 minutes long, but boy, it's good. It's good stuff. 
All right, let's get to our little thing that we're going to use create with. We're going to use Edpuzzle, and I cannot stress enough to you that this is just one tool uh, that you can use for universal design for learning. Uh, I like Edpuzzle because I think it sort of does everything that I think we're trying to get at here, but in a way that people can get their heads around it. I have an Edpuzzle account. You are more than welcome to use it. Uh, the login is sbswan02 at louisville.edu. Password is ULIT241. You are more than welcome to use that. It's lowercase, ULIT241, by the way. Um, and as you can see over here, there are people who have created um, UDL classes. So let's um, go ahead. I'll jump into our class. And what we're going to do is we're going to create. And the way you do this is it's based upon using YouTube. Okay. Actually, it's based upon using just about anything. Look at all the channels down here that you can use. And this is one of the things that I really like about it is because it can be used in so many different ways. Um, let me just grab a YouTube channel real fast here. And since I've got it on my brain, because I've been teaching about this uh, in another class, let's look up uh, gravity. And let's look at gravity in terms of something that is uh, understandable to a group of elementary school kids. So I'm not sure what this video is. So let me go ahead and just run it for a little bit and let's see. Oh, it's gravity falls. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just saw that. Okay. Um, Let me try that again. Gravity elementary. I think my spelling it wrong was part of the problem. And let's get rid of the gravity that was spelled wrong. Okay, now let's give it a shot. There we go. There we go. Okay, so if I go over here and I grab defining gravity and I watch it for a little bit. Okay. And I decide that that's something I want to play with. Now I did, oh, you didn't see what I did. Let me go show you what I did. So here's the video. I'm going to use it. I'm going to turn it into an Ed puzzle, an example of using universal design for learning. So I'm going to come down here and I'm going to do an edit on it. What it allows me to do is the following things. Number one, as you can see, it's basically allowing me to decide what part of the video that I want to use. Now, this video is not very long. It's three minutes and 12 seconds. So it's at a, it's at a size that is, I think, acceptable to most kids to be able to sit through and watch. You know, after seven minutes, most people drop off the map in terms of understand or, or paying attention to what you're doing. And so what you can do, though, is by grabbing these little lines here, these little ears, you can decide what parts of the video are the most important parts. Now, I'm doing this cold, right? I normally would sit here and watch the video and figure out where do things fit. But that's one way that you can do it. Now, we know this. <laughs> we know this. We know as good teachers that one of the most important things that we can do is chunking learning, breaking it down into smaller bits for kids to get. So that's the first one. VoiceOver allows you to put your voice into any part of 
the um, video that you want. Now, why would you do this? This is the way for you to jump in and do heads up. You can do an introduction. This is what we're going to be watching. It connects back to this and that and the other. And you just basically click on this little microphone and then the video starts and it starts recording what you're saying and then you stop it. Now I can drag my video over or I can let it play and wherever ever I wanted to within the video, I can do the voiceover trick. Okay. Now, if I don't want to do that, if I don't want to record my entire voiceover, I can drop in and leave little bits behind. Now watch this. This is really cool. So the voiceover is where you basically take over the entire audio track of the, of the video because it's too busy, it's too distracting, whatever. But now what you can do is you can run it and where you need to jump in and add your two cents or to give a heads up, look out for, watch this, pay attention now, you can do that. So I come this far into the video. I've got my mic all set down here and I can now record. Pay attention. This is where they're going to explain how mass and gravity go together. Stop. Okay. Move through some more. And the last thing you can do is you can go into quizzes. You can go into quizzes now and you can decide where you might want to put a quiz. Why would you do that? Again, to give kids an opportunity to chunk down the information and check their understanding. So right here, I decided past this point in the video, like I said, I'm cold on this video, so don't hold me to knowing the video. I can now say, okay, I'm gonna put a quiz in here. What kind of quiz can I have? Well. I can have an open-ended quiz. I can do a multiple choice quiz. I could do something like, who is this? And I can put the answers in here. I'm going to add answers. You know how to do this. You've done this a million times and other things. Okay. So now what I've done is I've added a nice little quiz into my video. So when you go back and look at what we have, let me go back and let's... At this point, what's happening is the audio of the video stops. Everything stops while I talk. And then it goes on for a little bit longer. And now here's your little quiz. You can save as you work. And when you're done, you click on finish. You can assign it to a class. Or you can do the public links. Okay. So what you're doing for our class is you're using a public link. You copy the link and you put it into the assignment part this module. Notice, um, for those of you who have been with me before, <laughs> you can do these ed puzzles in an embedded format and you can then have them quote unquote live. 
so you don't you're not linking to them you're actually seeing them in front of you last thoughts about edpuzzle before we finish up edpuzzle is also google classroom linked so you can create things inside of edpuzzle and link them directly into a google classroom pretty straightforward huh uh the you know i, I kind of jumped into um youtube -y. And uh, what I should have done is to have shown you all of the amazing very variables there are. If you go down here to National Geographic, there's some really, really good videos in here. And so, you know, part of what you're doing here is you are looking for, here, I'll do this for our friends from the planetarium you are looking at a way to get kids into content that you are reinforcing the entire time. And the thing I love about it is the content is so, so varied. You know, you got your classic Khan Academies, you got your classic YouTubes, but you also have your National Geographic, you have your uh, TED Talks, you have your number files. You, uh, you, it's just a lot of good stuff. All righty. So that is our last take. Uh, our module four, which was universal design for learning. Um, as you think through this process, so I can already hear the questions. Well, okay, so you're saying I've got to use the universal design for learning in one of my lessons that I'm going to create. Um, it does not have to be an Ed Puzzle. I give you the Ed Puzzle because it's, um, you know, part of what I teach. But if you want to use something else that you think does that, that's great. If you want to use the Ed Puzzle, make one. And as a part of the design, let me get in here and find it. Let's pull up the lesson plan. Where will we put this in our lesson plan? You know, I think that would be probably the thing that I would want to know. And I think that where it would go, I'm sorry, I'm looking for my lesson plan. Back a page, Steve, you went past it. Um, what we would do is you would be able to put it in as either a resource or as an assessment, okay? So that's where it would fit. I tell you what, next week when we do, well, not next week, by the way, we don't have class next week because that's your fall break. So it'd be the week after that. So the week after that, which will be the 15th of October, we wrap up this course. And then you have all that rest of that time uh, of October and November to get this done. Um, we'll go over how to connect up with me to make an appointment where we will share, you will run the collaborate and I'll be the person on the other, other side while you manipulate everything in front of me. But we'll go over on the 15th, I mean on uh, yeah, the 15th, how I could see you putting uh, something like this into one lesson of your mini unit. As always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you know how to reach me at 502-457-2937. Uh, I hope you have a nice fall break next uh, Monday and Tuesday. I'll be back. I'm leaving town. Uh, tomorrow and I'll be back uh, Monday afternoon so I'll be back in the office by Tuesday of next week if you want to come in if you're really kind of lost and just need to sit down and kind of get straight what we're doing here I think you're fine the stuff I've seen uh, in the assignments that have been handed in are all just wonderful good stuff as always okay talk to you soon